it's RetroCore and it's time to take a look at some more hardware. Today we're going to be taking a look at the new version of the Pow Kitty X17. Let's check it out. So yes, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the new version of the Pow Kitty X17. And it is quite a big beast. And it's been improved as well. As we can see, the specs now include a 5000 milliamp battery. I believe the old one did not have that. Also on the back of the box, we've got absolutely no information whatsoever. So yeah, they're not really shouting much about it, are they? Got a seven inch screen, which is touch screen support TV connection through HDMI and apparently this also supports casting as well because it runs on Android and also support Wi-Fi connection that is true so let's take a look and see what we get in the box okay so in the box we get a little baggie which the machine came in a manual which is in Chinese and also English if we open it up there you go we got the English side there in color we have this very weird barrel jack power adapter but not to worry you can also charge this using a standard micro USB cable and we have the quality assurance little uh, card thing there and of course the machine itself and as you can see this is a big boy and it's got this plastic on it so uh, let's take this off oh, big, big. oh yeah I hope that was good for you as it was for me and also we can see here there's also another screen protector on there as well nice so the machine itself is very big it's got a couple of scratches there but they are not on the screen that's on this plastic screen protector which I'm going to keep on for now we have an analog stick here we've got a d-pad which is reasonable volume controls power button this is a button to map controls to touch only Android games start button select button Face buttons there and then at the top we've got our shoulder triggers L1, L2, R1, R2 and a whole host of inputs. We've got the USB 1 and 2 to connect external USB controllers, our micro HDMI out, headphone socket, micro SD card slot, the DC in and also the uh, mini USB in, the micro USB in I should say. So we can charge it and transfer data onto the machine using that. On the back we have two slots here they are for our stereo speakers and they are stereo so that is a good sign so let's switch this on and you switch it on by uh, I forgot <laughs> okay I think we switch it on by just keeping our finger on the power button here and as you can see it boots up now I don't believe this has an IPS screen but it does have a fairly good screen that you can see on strange angles so you don't have to be looking dead on at the screen with this. You can look at it at various angles and still see it very clearly. So let's get a little bit closer to the screen and check out the content. Now when you first get the machine, it is filled with a load of Chinese apps. And to be honest, they are awful. Um, I've deleted all of them, so <laughs> they're not on here. But we've got the usual things like a happy chicken or whatever the hell it's called some 10 cent video player and all sorts of Chinese apps but yeah we don't want to mess with those so I've taken them all off this machine although this one here cannot be deleted by the way this is a touch screen so we can uh, basically just touch and go where we want to go in the settings we have all the usual Android type of settings connect to your Wi-Fi and so on we'll be taking a look at the cast feature later on but as far as settings go there's no difference than what you get on an Android phone nothing really too special apart from this option here where we can choose to map buttons to touch only games so what I did is I installed uh, if we go to apps I put Chrome on here and if we click on Chrome it goes straight to um, the uh, mapkpure.com um, website and I've done this because you cannot actually put the Google Play Store on here so you have to get your apps from a different location and this is a good place to get apps from Aptoide, I'm sure that's how you pronounce it that is another good place to get your apps from 
But with this one, you do tend to have um, slightly more out-of-date apps. I do prefer the other app store. All right, so let's take a look and see what I've put on this. So as you can see, I've put on a couple of games. We've got Riptide GP2 there and Minecraft Trial and a crap load of emulators. Look at this. I've put loads of emulators on here and even a bit of retro arch. So let's see how this device works. First of all, as a standard uh, Android game player, we'll go with Minecraft Trial Edition and see how that works. Okay, so we are loaded and we are now in Minecraft and as you can see it's moving pretty smoothly. Now unfortunately because this machine only has one analog stick, I am having to use the touch screen to uh, look around. But that's just one of the downsides to twin analog Android games. Don't forget this device is not, oh sorry, this game is not actually designed to run on um, with joystick controls. But I can jump using the buttons. Fortunately I need to touch the screen to attack. But at least I can use the analog stick to move forwards, backwards, left and right. And yes, it's moving at a decent pace. Okay, let's take a look at another Android game, which I've got on here, Riptide GP2. Now this one should have full analog controls. Yep, this is fully playable. No problem at all. And as you can hear, those speakers are quite clear. Alright, but what you guys are more interested in seeing is the emulation side of things, aren't you? I know you don't really care about the Android games. So let's take a look at some emulation running. Okay, to make it fair, we'll just get rid of everything here. Bye bye. And um, let's start off with a little bit of Mega Drive emulation. We know it's going to work, but let's try it out anyway. Now this particular emulator is capable of playing Mega CD, Mega Drive and 32X games. So let's take a look at a Mega CD game first. Uh, let's go into load. We'll go with um, Mega CD games. Okay, uh, eventually Batman and Rebel or Barry Arm. We'll go with Barry Arm. Let's load up the Q file. And we should get the Japanese uh, Mega CD logo. There we go. So just press start button as it asks us to do. And uh, let's start the game. Now I gotta apologize for the reflections here because it is quite a, a sunny day today. And um, yeah, there is a lot of reflections on this screen. Especially when it goes dark. But as you can see, it's working no problem and we can use the analog stick or the d-pad to control the movements. And I've got to say those stereo speakers on the back of this unit for games like this, CD games, really do sound quite nice. It's just a shame you're listening to this in mono because the sound's coming through my lavalier mic. Now, Mega Drive games are going to work perfectly, just like Mega CD games. Alright, let's check out some PC Engine games. And again, it's going to run PC Engine CD games, as well as normal Hue card games. And as you can see, PC Engine... Oops, I'm dead already. <laughs> Didn't last long, did I? <laughs> okay. And as you can see, as I was saying, uh, PC Engine games are very smooth. They run without any problems. Um, <laughs> I can't play this for supposed to save any. Oh man. Um, yeah. But yeah, anyway, as you can see, the games work perfectly well. No problems at all. And of course, all the PC Engine CD ROM games also work very, very well. Man, my gameplay skills suck. <laughs> okay, let's get out of that. Alright, Nintendo, that's going to work perfectly fine. Don't need to check that out. Super Nintendo. All right, let's check out Super Nintendo and see how it, how well it works. So we'll go with Doom. And yeah, as you can see, very smooth, very fast, no problem at all. Doom is playing well on this uh, device. 
And as you could also see then, the safe states do work. Okay, this game is going to be a bit of a test for the actual controls on this. Is it easy to get moves out? Well, we'll soon see. There we go. Yeah, the game freezes like that on a real machine, so don't worry. That's quite standard. And yeah, the controls are easy to pull off, or the special moves are easy to pull off, I should say. No problem whatsoever. Yep, easy. So as you can see, Super Nintendo emulation is good, not a problem. Alright, so let's get out of that and move on to the next machine. Okay, so when you start off the emulator, these uh, on-screen controls are viewable, but they will disappear. As you see, they've just disappeared now. And also, full screen. In fact, I should point out that all the emulators can be made to run full screen. So, if you like, uh, you know, stretch games, no problem, you can stretch them out. But this game should be in this aspect of the show, so that's not a problem. Alright, so let's uh, get into the race. Now, you see, we've got the little black bar down here. That's because we've got the um, buffering switched off. If you switch the buffering on, it really. Let me just turn down the volume there. It really does slow down the emulation. So, um, for this game, you've got to turn the buffering off. But as you can see, it is super smooth. No juddering, no frame skipping or anything. It's very, very nice. Oops. Now what is interesting, if we uh, go to the outside view, now how do we do that? Here we go, that black bar's gone. But for me to play uh, Ridge Race in the outside view is quite difficult. Where's my brake anyway? Here we go, lovely done. Nope, nope, not lovely done. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we can exit out of that and let's just check out um, another game. Oops. Okay, so as you can see, this is running quite nicely here. Now, while this is a real time cutscene, um, it's not representative of the game, so let's get into the actual game section. Alright, and as you can see, that is moving quite nicely. Okay, so here we are in an actual gameplay situation. And as you can see, it's running just fine, as it would on a real PSP. Okay, let's see if we get the... Uh, fire going, uh, how do we do that? Oh, I've messed it up now by skipping frames, here we go. Okay, the next system we're taking a look at is the Game Boy Advance and we're gonna run it on some games that always give trouble to emulators, we'll start off with a bit of Duke Nukem 3D or Duke Nukem Advanced and we'll see how that works. I mean, if this runs perfectly smooth, it's going to run anything, isn't it? Okay, let's get into it. And yeah, it's super smooth, super fast, not a problem. That's to be expected. 
And you will also notice that the resolution is the right resolution for the Game Boy, or the screen ratio, I should say. I've got a bit of a black bar down there and a bit of a black bar there to keep it at the right aspect ratio. That's good. Okay, let's try um, another Game Boy Advance game, another one that pushes the machine a lot. All right, let's uh, get out of that. All right, we'll go with the asterisk here, and with this, I can show you one of the save states working. So we'll just uh, press the button there, load up a save state. Yep. And there we go, straight into my saved game. And again, this is another game that really pushed the Game Boy Advance, and as you can see, it's working without any issues. Nice and smooth, and sounds really good. Let me just turn up the volume. Yeah. As you can hear, it's perfect. Alright, so that's Game Boy Advance emulation there. No problem whatsoever. Now the introduction is running very well there, but I've got frame skipping switched off. So let's just see how well this does. It might choke in a minute. Ah, uh, there we go, it's choking now. Hmm. Not too bad. Okay, let's get into the actual game and uh, see how it handles that. Well, it seems to be handling this quite well. Let's get down to the ground, see if we get any stuttering once we get close to the ground. No, it's smooth as can be. So it's just that introduction that gave it a little bit of trouble. Okay, let's see if we can blow something up, get some particles going. Okay, we're sticking with Dreamcast and a bit of tennis spike. Let's see how this one works. Is this gonna be just as smooth? as Propeller Arena. Hmm, a little bit of juddering there. Ah, uh, no, this is not as smooth, is it? Yeah, the sound emulation's going on it a little bit. So, maybe, with a changing couple of settings, maybe putting frame skip on, might be able to make this one run smoother. But those particle effects are really uh, pushing the uh, emulation, I think. Okay, moving on to a bit of PlayStation now. This is Tekken 3, running on the Duck Station emulator. Now, as you can see, not a problem. Tekken 3 be one of those games that pushes the machine. So, if it's gonna run this, it's gonna run pretty much anything. Now, unfortunately, this thing does not run Sega Saturn very well. Um, okay, let's go with a bit of Batagun, see how that works. Yep, I'm running the high Saturn BIOS. Makes me feel much nicer since that's what I used to play Sega Saturn games. Alright, let's see how a 2D game works. I'm not expecting this to be uh, very good. Because I remember in my original testing, it didn't run very well. Okay, let's uh... Yeah, there you go, you can hear a stuttering already. Turn the volume up a bit so you can hear that. Yeah, see? It's juddering like crazy. 
And when you put the frame skip on, it's really bad at skipping loads of frames. And, uh, and my controls aren't working now either. <laughs> oh, what happened to my controls? <laughs> Great. But yeah, anyway, as you can see, Saturn emulation is not very good at all. And when you try them on 3D stuff, it's even worse. Um, now, I thought maybe with the introduction of Retro Arch, we can choose better Saturn emulation, but unfortunately not. So um, let's uh, look for Sega Saturn emulator. There we go, let's see what we've got. Uh, see, we've got the same Saturn emulator, but this will be the most recent version. Um, let's load up a game, and it won't even load, watch this. Where's my Saturn games, there we go in here. So we'll put Batsugun in again. We'll load up the Q file. And uh, yeah, it fails to load. It just will not load the games. So yeah, for some reason um, Saturn emulation under RetroArch does not work on this device. Uh, other emulators do, but uh, Saturn one doesn't. Okay, so we've seen the emulation. You've got an idea of the power of this machine when it comes to emulation. But uh, what I want to see is can it work pretty well with external controllers and how is the HDMI out video out and also can we use the cast function to broadcast the signal from this onto the TV we'll check all these features out right now so here we are over by the TV and we can see that this has in fact picked up the TV so we should be able to broadcast the signal from this onto the TV wirelessly. So let's see if it connects up. Okay, it says it's pairing with the TV and apparently the TV has found it. So let's press accept on the TV. And let's see if this will be connected. Seems to be, but for some reason it says play your mobile device sound through TV speakers. Uh, yeah. But why can we not play any of the games? Hmm. It seems that this device only connects the audio to the actual thing. So it says screen off there. Let's, uh, oh no, that's to turn off the screen on the TV. Yeah, that's not what we want to do. Um, yeah, okay, so it seems that this device does not actually uh, broadcast the games onto the TV screen only uh, the audio that's playing and uh, at the moment it's not playing any audio whatsoever so uh, let's just test it with a video file so I've got a video file on here uh, as you can see we've got a um, bit of history here on the old videos so let's uh, see what we've got let's uh, play this and see what we get yeah, no audio at all coming from the TV. Now that is unusual. Oh, here we go. So that is the sound coming from this video clip here. And this is a video clip taken from an upcoming uh, Mega Drive uh, music video, uh, music collection I'm doing. But yeah, it seems all we get is the audio coming through the TV. <laughs> Well, that is a bit of a shame, isn't it? Okay, let's connect this device up to the TV using HDMI. All right, here we go. We have now got the device connected up to the TV. And yep, there is no noticeable lag whatsoever. The screens change at the exact same time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect up an external controller to one of the USB hubs on the back of this and see if we can use it as an actual games console. Okay, as you can see, we have got it connected up using the Sega Saturn USB controller. Pretty much any USB controller will work. But yeah, it functions perfectly well, or at least here in the menus. So let's play a game using a control pad. And here we go playing Harmful Park on the PlayStation, running on the PAL Kitty X17 using a Sega Saturn USB controller. What a combination. <laughs> Thank you. 
as you can see it's working perfectly so you could use this handheld as a console just connect it up to your TV add a couple of controllers and off you go now I have tried this with a few different USB controllers the 8-bit door one seems to work just fine Xbox 360 controller seemed to work just fine and a PlayStation 3 USB controller worked just fine. Some games do require you to configure the joysticks or the joy pads and the buttons but you want you know once you've configured them they work without any problems. As for input lag well I'm sure there is some but to be honest it's not really noticeable. No different than playing an emulator on a PC. So there we have it. That is the new version of the Pal Kitty X17. A fairly decent device. I quite like it. It's got a lot of good features on it, such as it plays a lot of different emulators. It plays Android games. You can watch videos on it. You can listen to music. You can browse the internet. You can connect it up to a TV and use it as a real console. You can also use external control pads. On the downside, it does not play all the games I'd want it to play. Dreamcast emulation is still a bit spotty. PSP, depending on the game, may have some graphical effects. Retro Arch seems to be quite limited on it when it comes to the more powerful systems. And as you can see here, Sega 32X is not running full speed. Although with a little configuration, maybe that can be fixed. So yeah. It's a fairly decent device for a fairly reasonable price. And the thing that surprised me the most is the touchscreen. It's nice, big and clear. And also I do like the way that the standard uh, A, B, X, Y buttons light up. If I switch off the lights here, you can see them illuminated in the dark. Now that is a nice touch. As for battery levels, well, I've had this going for about five, ye five years, sorry, five hours and still had power left at the end of that. So the battery does seem to be fairly good. It does say it comes with a 5000 milliamp battery and I would believe them because it does seem to last quite a long time and I've had no issues with it over the last month I've been testing this machine out. Unfortunately, one of the downsides is, is when you get it, you don't get any micro SD cards so you don't get any games except the ones that the Chinese factories put on with a lot of Chinese apps. You want to get rid of all those Chinese apps as soon as possible because you have no idea what they are sending back to China in regards to our personal data. But yeah, reasonable price, reasonable specs, reasonable machine. Link in the video description down below if you want to pick one up. So next time guys, take it easy and keep on gaming. See ya!